So, and this is kind of what I recommend for people who are like, I tried budgeting. I don't ever want to do that again. That sounds too mm-hmm. constrictive, blah, 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 all that stuff. Uh, if you're that person, like I would point you to the one category budget. And this is basically like the 80-20 of it. You start by tracking your spending. And then from there, identifying, all right, what is the one category that if I could basically rein myself in on this category, that would make the biggest amount of difference. And so for mm-hmm. a lot of people, it's food. Hey, welcome back to Born Unstoppable. My name is Chiago and I'm your host. And today I'm going to be talking to Bob Lotek, a financial entrepreneur and expert. A little bit about Bob is that he found himself at his breaking point in his early 20s, overwhelmed by debt, stranded a thousand miles from home with only $7 to his name. After crying out to God for wisdom and discovering a simpler and far more effective approach to money, he reached a level of financial freedom he never dreamed possible, having paid off his house by age 31 and even reaching a personal goal of giving $1 million by age 40. For the past 14 years, he shared his best lessons with over 50 million readers and listeners on his award-winning blog, SeaTime.com and SeaTime money podcast all right hi bob how are you doing today i am doing wonderful thank you for having me brother good thanks for coming on the podcast i'm excited to uh just get to know a little bit more about your story um and and wisdom the the lived wisdom and also just the wisdom that you've got gained from having your writing the book and also the the coaching courses that that you do yeah Yeah. no i'm excited to chat wherever you want to go all right. So I think one place that that's helpful for everybody is kind of giving us a brief kind of background in regards to where you came from and how did you get to where you are right now? Yeah. So uh, I spent a good amount of time working in the financial services industry, and um, I'll get to that in a minute. But the reason I bring that up is because I've encountered a lot of people in this industry who uh, for lack of a better way of communicating, just were dealt a little bit of a not a good financial hand, a little bit silver spoon type thing. Um, and I'm like the opposite of that. Um, and not like destitute, you know, growing up, but very much a middle class home. My dad was a blue collar worker who was injured multiple times and out of work for years at a time. Like, you know, so we had some very tight financial seasons growing up. Um, and, but, you know, but still a middle-class hand, you know, still privileged in a good number of ways. And, um, mm-hmm. and anyway, I ended up finding myself at age 20, uh, broken down about a thousand miles away from home with $7 in my bank account and one credit card that was nearly maxed out and just found myself in this position where I realized I don't know how to do money as well as I thought I did because I was kind of cocky, you know, young 20 something, um, and I would have told, and I probably did tell everyone around me, I'm good at managing money. Like I'm good at money. Like, cause they've done s- studies that have shown, I think it's like 77% of Americans say that they're good at managing money. Um, uh, and yet when you look at how most Americans financial lives are like something doesn't add up there, you know? Yeah. And I was one of those where I, I didn't know what I didn't know. And, uh, anyway, and so that was kind of my breaking point moment for, for me, like where, I ended up crying out to God asking for help. I'm like, if you have a better plan on all this, like I'd love to hear it because my path, my plan has not worked very well. And so that's kind of what kickstarted my financial journey out of my mess into something that (laughs) resembles, I don't know, something a little bit better at this point, I guess. Yeah. And from there, what kind of jobs did you have? And that that led you to kind of being known as kind of like the financial guy or being in yeah. that financial space. Yeah, it's one of those things because um, I talk about calling and purpose a lot and that whole thing. And one of the interesting things is that I think a lot of times in our lives, like it just it finds us. And so I never mm-hmm. intended to become a financial guy or I just never thought that this would be the path that I went. But I happened to who. Um, you know, right after that moment, being stranded and broken down, whatever, all that thing, like my next job was working at a bank. And then I worked at a bank for a few years. Um, and I, I didn't put these two and two together. And then after that, I went and worked at a brokerage firm and, um, financial services firm. And I, 
in my mind, I wasn't, I was just looking for a job. Like I wasn't thinking, Ooh, I want to move down the financial field. I want to learn about finances because someday I'm going to write a book about it. Like that was the yeah, furthest yeah. thing from my mind. It was just, there was a job there. And so I went, but I ended up spending a, um, another five years in the financial services industry and learning a lot about, you know, how things go on there. Uh, and then out of that, that was, that led me to 2000 and I guess eight at that point, which financial crisis, all that stuff, tons of, Financial firms are going under. My firm got bought out by a bigger one. Our department was redundant, completely unnecessary. So our entire department got let go. And so that led me to um, going on this adventure of becoming a full-time blogger in 2008, talking about money, writing about money. Uh, so so anyway, that was kind of like work-wise what I did that ended up getting me to where I went. Now, there's no real strategy there. It's just that just happened hey. to be how it went, you know? <laughs> Yeah. And uh, one of the topics that I want to focus on is kind of like the faith and finances perspective. How yeah. has your faith played uh, a role in your journey to becoming like this, this now personal finance expert and entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, a, a huge role. I mean, I, I would say like, whatever, 90% if I had to like break right. it down into percentages, because, you know, because I've done what I can do in my own strength, but so much of what has happened in our financial lives is outside of my own strength. It's outside of my own intelligence. It's just God doing bigger things than that. Um, and so like that example of me going from having this day job at this big fortune 500 company, um, you know, fortune 500 financial company to, all right, it's 2008. No one knows what a blog is, but I'm going to go do it full time. You know, and adding to that story and the, the craziness of this a little bit is I had been working on that blog for an entire year, like part time, like probably five to 10 hours a week writing for it, like continuing to try to promote it, all this stuff. And after a year, I was earning one hundred dollars per month. Mm -hmm. And like so, you know, so just putting that in perspective, like the kind of insanity and like the pitch I had to make to my new wife of um, a few years at that point. So, hey, hon, I want to become a full time blogger. Like it was very it was just out there but it was one of those things where uh i just knew that we were supposed to do it i knew that it was something right. god was calling me to and anyway and that like opened the door like that catapulted us into uh this whole new world you know financially as well as career wise like all of it you know like our our income from then nine months later i was earning more from the blog than my old day job and then another six months later we had doubled it um so like just just from our income and earning potential, like that one thing, that wasn't because I was so smart. It was just because I was trying to follow what I felt like God was leading me to do. And so, so that's always our encouragement. Like in terms of your finances, the thing that you think um, is the smartest thing often might not be, especially if you feel like God's calling you in a different direction. Yeah. And did you have experience prior to that of listening to God or feeling like he was directing you a certain way. Cause I feel if you don't have like that practice of sitting mm -hmm. and kind of reflecting, you know, is this something that God wants me to do? You, you might miss it if you're not yeah. conscious about it. Like, did you have experience yeah. prior to that? Yeah. I mean, so I've been a Christian since I guess probably 13 years old or something. Um, and I, I would say that that was, I would say when I was 20 is when I really decided I'm not, I'm not doing this halfway anymore because all through my teenage years, I would feel like it's kind of like halfway Christian. Like I kind of went to church, but I just wasn't serious about my walk with God. But once I turned 20, I decided I, I just don't want to be like a, in the middle. It's like I'm either all in or I'm not. And so from that point forward, I really sought to hear the Lord and to, to follow his voice. And, um, and I haven't been perfect at this. I don't think any Christian has, but but I've tried, you know, the Bible says my sheep know my voice and the voice of a stranger yeah. they won't follow. And, um, and I think there's something about when we try to hear his voice that he's going to make himself known. Like ultimately it's his responsibility, you know, to yeah. communicate in a way that we can pick it up. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't think he's like trying to throw these curve balls at us. Like, I wonder if you're going to, you know, I, yeah. I think he wants us to be able to accurately hear him. Um, and so, so yeah, like there had been other experiences as well where it just felt like this just feels crazy, but I just kind of feel like God's calling me to do that. And, and oftentimes the way that I identify that is, um, it's a thought that 
you know, comes into my mind or in my heart that it's like, I wouldn't have come up with that. <laughs> like, I, I just wouldn't have come up with that. And then on top of that, when there's a that's combined with some sense of peace in my heart that doesn't make sense, you know, a peace that passes understanding, as the Bible would call it, uh, where it's like, you know, and that's what that was, that journey of I'm making $100 a month on this blog that I've been working on for a year. And this is so crazy, but yet there's a peace in, in me as I kind of step out in this that doesn't make any sense. Um, so those are come, some of the things I look for when I am in these moments where I'm facing some of these, I don't know, God adventures or things that he might be calling me to. Yeah, that's really neat. That's something that I'll definitely uh, try to be incorporate that more. Like I want to be able to practice that spiritual discipline of re- of really listening to God um not just praying and leaving but praying and give allowing time for God to respond whether it's so through good. his word or those uh, friends and family um going off of that like can you share some biblical principles that you've learned along the way that have influenced how you deal with your personal finance yeah yeah, there's a lot here. Um, and I keep finding more and more about business, which is, you know, a little bit of a tangent, but um I just started reading the book of Proverbs and it's funny when you start reading it, uh, thinking through that lens of the financial lens, and you just start uncovering all these lessons. It's like, whoa, okay, that says not to spend up all your money. You know, it's like in this Proverbs twenty two seven or something. I don't know what it is. Um, I don't remember all the specific passages, but um, you just find these over and over again where it's like, oh, wow, that says, um, you know, the borrower's uh, servant to the lender. It's like, I've felt like that. I get that. Um, You know, there's another passage that talks about not co-signing a loan for someone um, in which anyone who's done that, it's like, you know, it works out okay sometimes. But like statistically speaking, I read this article in the New York Times where it basically said it's a terrible idea. Like, all it does is destroy relationships. And then there's like 10% of the time where it works out okay. But most times it is a bad thing because it changes the dynamic of the relationship from a we're friends or we're mother and daughter to now it's debt debtor relationship. And that right. is a different thing. Um, so, I mean, yeah, there, there's tons of different things that I've learned over the years um, uh, that have affected how I manage my money. But the biggest, most important one by far, I mean, you know, which I just kind of hinted at is I think just following the voice of the Lord and what he's asking you to do, you know, because uh, that seems to supersede everything else. And it's like, if you look at all the miracles throughout the Bible, that's how so many of them um, were kickstarted with God kind of speaking or encouraging someone to do something normally that seemed very, very crazy or insane. Mm-hmm. Like, well, talk, talk about Jericho. Let's march around the wall quietly for seven days and then yell as loud as you can. Uh, it's just like, that's a terrible idea. That's as bad of a possible idea as you can come up with, you know, or whatever, <laughs> or having a um, few loaves and fishes and we're going to feed 5,000 people. It's like, this is just a terrible idea. But when you sense that this is what God's calling you to do, that that's where you see the crazy miracles are so much bigger than anything else you could do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's because thanks for sharing those examples. Um, Kind of going off of, I guess the debt, but I I listened to a podcast of yours recently where you were, where you, you were interviewed. And I think the host mentioned that in the Bible, Jesus compares himself to to money or the love of money um, multiple times more than anything, because oftentimes that love of the material object or money supersedes our love for him or for God. So, and I find myself kind of stuck in the middle and you guys discuss this where as a Christian, you kind of fall into the extremes of you, you you really want money and you can use it to bless people. But on the same side, it's other people think that pursuing money is bad and it's better to live poor, you know, and then yeah. you kind of, you want to land in the middle, but there's these like magnetic forces pulling you from either side. Can you elaborate a little bit of how you think about that uh, area? Yeah. Yeah. The balance, uh, it's like anything else. I think there's a lot of facets of our, 
Christian walk that requires balance and where it's easy to go to the extremes. And, um, and I think that's why a lot of people do it because it is easy to go to those extremes and draw these hardline rules or make rules to prevent you from breaking rules type of thing. But, um, to your point, like, it's not easy. It's not an easy road to walk. Um, but like for us, like I, you know, this is part of what we wrote in the book, like just the formula that it was based off of, um, um, sorry, John Wesley's quote where he said, I make all I can. Um, and then I save all I can so that I can give all I can. And I've always just been really inspired by that. I mean, you know, and especially John Wesley, he's a preacher, um, who ended up being one of the highest income earning people in all of England at the time. You know what I mean? And so like so many people are like, why is a preacher trying to make all this money? And it's like, it was so beautiful because it's like he wasn't doing it just to build himself like the biggest mansion or palace in all of England, but he was doing it so that he could give more and impact the kingdom that way. And he saw his ability, his gift to write and his ability to speak as a means to not only impact the world through that, but then also to generate income from that to be able to impact the world again. And, um, and that's my heart. That's my, uh, yeah, my desire, you know, that's why I want to continue to earn, earn more money and I want to grow my income. Uh, you know, again, for me, it's not just to build the biggest house or buy all the flashiest cars or Gucci bags or whatever. Like, um, and it's like, and I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem buying a nice house or whatever. Like it's not that, but it's about when you think of yourself as an eternal being and you think beyond this short little life that we have, it just makes a whole lot more sense to uh, use that money to impact um, the kingdom and to do eternal things with it. So anyway, so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm trying to land this plane and come back to your question a little bit more, but point is that tension is there, but I think when your heart is right, and, and this isn't a black and white, right? It's a, yeah. we're always, I think, growing in this and just trying to stay in the right heart posture. Um, uh, but when you're doing that, I think there's a really big opportunity, um, to be used by God in a really significant way versus if you are of the mindset of um, money is completely evil and I'm going to stay away from money as, as much as I can. If my boss offers me a raise, no, I'm not going to take it like whatever. Like it, there, there comes a point of almost absurdity with that where it's like there, there's so much potential here and you're just missing yeah. it, you know? Yeah. It's really important to, to view it as a, a tool. I can take you further but it's going to require a lot of heart checks along the way as we kind of mature from stage to stage. Like for me right now, I'm maturing into becoming a doctor, going to residency. And it's like the first time in my life where I'm actually going to have access to, to, to money that I'm earning. That's a good residence salary is okay. But then after that, as a full attending doctor, it's going to be a lot more. And with that comes the challenge of like, Oh, what am I going to do with that money? And then when I have k- kids, it's like, oh, am I going to buy everything for my kids? So it's like constant checkpoints that we have to ask ourselves, like, what's the motive here? And yeah. I, I like your perspective of focusing on the eternal because that kind yeah. of like removes the clutter. And it's like, all right, what's the, how can I serve the kingdom of God, which is eternal? Yeah. So along those lines and and you'll find this um assuming you get the nice pay bump when you step into the new position uh i think two of the biggest tests for believers you know that not everyone goes through but i think particularly for believers uh who are dealing with uh i don't know i I don't know best way to word this but basically uh operate on a higher level of income like are the two biggest tests i think are when your income jumps from here to here in a significant amount. Like, so we had that, like we watched our income go up way faster than we realized. And that, that is a really big heart test. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, but then the other really interesting heart test too, which we experienced as well is when your income is really high and then it drops by a ton. And, and I think that God just wants to know where you're at in all this, where's your heart? Like, are you going to be after me regardless of what happens in your bank account? And that when you can be in that position, this is what Paul talks about in um, Philippians 4, I believe, learning how to abase and abound. And, and he learned the secret of being content in the high times and the low times. Like that, I believe, is true financial freedom. Because when it's not, 
your financial freedom isn't tied to a number in your bank account or having $5 million saved up or whatever. But when it's actually the freedom to be content and to be happy and at peace, uh, regardless of that, um, yeah. that's really powerful, you know? Yeah. I agree. So let's transition a little bit from, from kind of faith and finances, although it's applicable during the entire podcast, uh, to kind of like debt management. Like when, when you're discussing with people who have a lot of debt or going to have, what are your go-to tips for tackling that debt? And then maybe more specifically for students as well, like tackling student loans and other debts that come with that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the funny answer is just wait for the government to pay it off. Um, <laughs> we'll see what happens with that. But uh, but anyway, um, but no, my answer is not wait for the government <laughs> because uh, it's it was funny when Biden was first talking about um, paying off student loans and all this stuff. And right. um, I'm like, listen, I, I think you should still pay your loans because I don't know that this is going to happen. Like just because he said he wants to do it doesn't mean it's a done deal. And um, and people were yelling at me on Instagram and whatever. And then what do you know? A couple months later, it's like, well, I don't know if that's going to happen after all. So, uh, yeah. so anyway, I think the point is, is like, don't wait around for the government or anyone else. You do need to, you know, pay it. And if the government wants to come pay some off, then great, you know, enjoy it. Um, but at the end of the day, like you just have to understand it's a journey um, and it takes time. And yeah, and we live in an era where, uh, between student loans or be, between medical debt, like there's just a lot of people who find themselves strapped with a ton of debt. You know, I mean, you know this. You probably have tons of friends who just have lots and lots of debt. Yeah. Um, and and I think the, the good thing for you in your situation is, you know, hopefully as soon as you get out, you'll be able to get a great paying job and chop it down really fast. But but what I would do if I were in a situation like yours is. Um, do whatever I can do to live on the income now or, you know, or even previous to where you are now, like live on, uh, more or less like that, just like getting by salary, just so you, you have whatever, if that's 30% or 50% of your income so that you can just make massive amounts of, um, you know, huge payments towards that debt as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Cause I think the biggest problem, what you see is, as soon as the income increases, then the lifestyle just increases. It's like, all right, so now I'm here. And so now I can buy this car. I can buy the seven series or I can buy the Benz or whatever. And I need to buy the, get this loft downtown and I need to do this and I need to dress this way to look this. So that stuff just so quickly erodes all of that extra cash that you find yourself living paycheck to paycheck. And like, no one believes this until you actually experience it, but it's just the way it works over and over and over again. It's that lifestyle creep. And so the absolute best thing you can do is lock your standard of living down um, and just force yourself to do that just so that, you know, you can make big chunks towards or chop off big amounts towards that um, debt. So that's how I would approach it in a situation like yours. Now, somebody with medical debt um, where it's like I don't have the advantage of my income increasing at a certain point to pay off my student loans. Right. Um, it's a whole different animal, you know, and I, I would say with that, I think. Um, one of the best things to do is work uh, strategically with some of those providers to be able to negotiate the discounts um, on paying them off. Sometimes if you pay them in full, like, in, yeah, there's, and honestly, just communicating with them. Cause I mean, I've heard multiple stories too of uh, significant amounts of medical debt just being wiped off because oh. someone communicated with the doctor or the doctor's office and told them their situation, <laughs> you know? So it's like just communicating with them is a helpful thing. Um, but anyway, so those are like kind of wide sweeping generalities. But it, one other kind of angle on this too is uh, if you want to have more money, um, disposable money, we'll call it disposable, that you can put towards debt, like you have to be paying attention to what's going on like with your expenses. Because if you're not, then you have this thing like everyone else does at the end of the month, you're like, where'd all the money go? And it's like... And this is what most people do. It's like, I just spend my money on Venmo's here, whatever, cash apps here, credit cards here, like all the stuff just going out. And then you get to the end of the month. It's like, oh, wow, money's gone. And or there's a credit card balance. It's like, oh, I was trying to pay that off every month. But now I guess I can't this month, you know. 
And so yeah. it's so important to be actually paying attention to what you're doing and setting up something at least that resembles a budget so that you have some walls in place, some friction to keep you from going where you don't want to go. And that is the way that you have money left over at the end of the month, which you can then use to pay down your debt. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. If you can, if you don't track it, you can't improve it. Absolutely. Uh, one one question that comes up often, at least in within like my medical colleagues uh, at my stage of training, is do you have a preference between like paying off debt first or all of it and like investing? Because there's like there's interest on the debt, but maybe sometimes with uh, I don't know like the S and P five hundred, there's like an eight percent return every year. I'm not very uh, financially savvy, but I think that's kind of like the general trend over the last decades. Um, what do you often recommend for people to pay off that dead quick or maybe do some investments as well? Yeah. So I've kind of evolved with my thinking on this over the years, but, uh, I started investing while I was paying off debt and I don't regret that at all. And so it made my debt pay off a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. But um, the the main reason that I'm excited or glad that I did that is because it kickstarted my investing education. Because for um, because unless you have an incredibly high salary and a low cost of living that you're just kind of locking yourself on, like for most people, like investing is the way that you really get your money to work for you and to amplify. And either way, even in a situation like that where somebody's making two hundred thousand dollars a year, living off of fifty thousand a year, like you still want that money to go work for you. And that's what's so powerful about learning how to invest. And so, um, I'm all for getting started investing early. Now, that said, I think in many cases. Um, putting the majority of your financial energy towards paying off debt makes more sense. Because yes, the S&P on average, whatever, 8 to 9% over the last what are 50 years or whatever. Um, but the debt that you're paying off, and especially depending on what their interest rates are, if they're credit cards or something, like that's a guaranteed right. <laughs> return on your money. You know, If you're paying 22% each month, it's 22% going out the door. It's like you're not going to find an investment that isn't a guaranteed 22%. So like... So if you view it through that lens, it's like, all right, let's get rid of that. I mean, I call those negative investments um, yeah. because it's like you're losing money and you have the opportunity to eliminate that, that 22% each month. So in general, like I would recommend focusing most of your financial energy on paying off the high interest debt, um, but start investing. Yeah. Like that's do it. Like start putting some money in there just because. I don't know, like you can do all these mock portfolios with investing and I'm pretending to invest in the S&P or I'm pretending to invest in this stock. And I think there's some value in education that comes from that. But at the end of the day, like you don't really learn about investing until you have skin in the game. It's like yeah. once you put money in, once you lose money, like you really start learning. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's so yeah. So that's why I'm so glad I started investing at a relatively young age. I think I was probably 22 or 23. Um and I, I don't regret it at all. My uh, dog <laughs> decided to come on my lap for some reason. Cute. Okay. <laughs> all right. So I think debt-wise, we covered the most important things. And it's going to vary for each person and what kind of debt they have, the kind of good debt, bad debt credit card debt always bad like you said like 22 yeah. percent. that's hard to come back from so if we transition on to like budgeting and saving over the the years um what are some of the favorite tricks or just methods that you've discovered and used uh, for creating a budget and um and like sticking to a budget yeah so yeah i'll try to uh, i'll try to keep this condensed but um Long story short, so like I said, started blogging in 2008 about money over the last, whatever, 15, 16 years, 17 years, I don't know what it's been. Uh, I have tried pretty much every budgeting app, software, tool, spreadsheet out there. Um, so I have this unique uh, perspective of having tried all these different things. 
and some I like better than others. But at the end of the day, I'm married to a spender, um, God mm. lover, and <laughs> we could not get any of them to work for us as a unit. And so what did finally work for us is what we call our real money method, <clears throat> which is basically where we're using our bank accounts. And we have a whole course that goes deeper in this, but basically yeah. we use our bank accounts to budget. Um, and so that is the, the one thing that actually worked for us to help us to not waste tons of time filling out millions of spreadsheets and blah, blah, blah. Like I, I just didn't want to, I'm not a hyper personal finance nerd where I want to spend 10 hours a week doing stuff. Like I just, I want it to be quick and easy and most importantly work. And so that's the thing that's worked for us. Now, kind of the boiled down version of that uh, is what we call the one category budget. And so, and this is kind of what I recommend for people who are like, I tried budgeting. I don't ever want to do that again. That sounds too mm -hmm. constrictive, blah, 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 all that stuff. Uh, if you're that person, like I would point you to the one category budget. And this is basically like the 80-20 of it. And I, I came kind of thinking through this little hacker mindset um, from the 80-20 principle, like just thinking, all right, what if we could get 80% of the benefits of budgeting with only 20% of the work? Like that would be a win, I think, for a lot of people, especially people who don't want to budget, you know? Yeah. And so that's where this whole concept started. And essentially what this looks like is you start by tracking your spending, what we're talking about, use a tool like personal capital or mint to be able to identify, all right, how much am I spending each month on groceries? How much am I spending each month on whatever Uber eats or uh, ride shares or toothpaste or whatever, like just getting some clarity on how much you're spending each month. Like what are those averages for the last few months? And each of those tools will allow you to do that pretty quickly and easily. And then from there, identifying, all right, what is the one category that if I could basically rein myself in on this category, that would make the biggest amount of difference. And so for mm -hmm. a lot of people, it's food, you know, um, but it <laughs> might be something else for someone else, you know. Uh, so it might be eating out. It might be, again, calling Uber Eats. It might be, uh, who knows? I don't really know. But point is, you identify that. And then say, okay, so let's just say it's groceries and we're spending $500 a month or we're spending $800 a month. Or we want to spend $500 or we think we can spend $500, but we keep wasting money when we go to the grocery store. Or whatever. <clears throat> and so what you do at that point is you create a separate checking account. So we have our normal checking account, create a separate one, get a whole separate debit card. In that checking account, we move $500 in at the beginning of the month. And then that debit card is only for groceries. And so we have a little bit of a wall in place and it forces us to stay accountable to that. Um, and you can do this in multiple ways. You could buy a gift card, you know, at the beginning of each month for that grocery store or something like that. And, you know, and that's it. That's what we have. But the point is you're putting a wall up and that wall, that friction is required um, for you to stay accountable. And what it does is like, because the initial thought is, well, that's confining and constricting. And it's like, I guess to some extent a little bit, but the the real issue is if you're just actually thinking about it, because like, that's what it does. It forces you to think about it more because it's like, I don't want to run out of grocery money by the end of the month. And so you're yeah. thinking about it more. And just by thinking about it more, you now prevent that from getting to the point where it is um, constricting you as much, you know? And so that that whole process of just adding that friction, like just will free up money for you. It just works, you know? Yeah. And uh I have a story of a, a roommate I used to live with a couple of years ago, and he used to order Starbucks every day, like mm. just coffee and maybe a, a sandwich or something. Yeah. And I'm like, bro, like, why, why don't you just make coffee at home? Like every day. I'm like, let's look at how much, how much you're spending. He pulls out his yeah. app and each order was like $20. I'm like, oh, $20 yeah. per day. He's like, no, just during the week. I'm like, okay, so let's pull out the calculator. $20 <laughs> a week for all 52 weeks was like seven thousand dollars on coffee i'm like listen i have a coffee maker <laughs> i'll save you seven thousand dollars if if you want to use my coffee maker and uh he was he never considered it because he just always had access to money i mean his job yeah. paid well enough that he didn't have to worry about it and he's a guy that never did any like doesn't know how to cook he always bought things growing up. Yeah. Um, yes. And I was just so surprised about that. Anyways, after that, yeah. he started using my coffee maker and uh, saved him a couple of bucks. But yeah, and I have yeah. friends that are foodies. They love to go out and just eat. And 
I guess if you're not spending money with groceries, then that's different. But yeah, so we definitely live in a more of a spending economy. Yeah. And I, and I think there's an important distinction here too, because I'm not the guy who's like, um, going to tell you or anyone else, like quit spending stuff on all the stuff you like, quit spending money on all the stuff you like, you know, like I am all for spending money on the things that you value and are important to you, but they should be intentional. Like, cause in his case, the coffee was just the default. It was just the, the habit that was established. It wasn't, he probably wasn't getting that much enjoyment out of it. But if he was making coffee at home five days a week and then one day a week he went to Starbucks, I'll bet he enjoyed that a whole lot more because now it's a treat. Now it's something special. And then, you know, and so there's so many things like that where we just do them as a habit or out of default. And as a result, we, yeah, (laughs) we're just wasting money, you know? Yeah. And going off of that kind of like just, it's okay to spend money. It's okay to enjoy the money you do have. Um, Can you talk a little bit about spending money now versus in the future? And I'll tell you why I'm asking this question. Uh, We recently had like a financial seminar and uh, we're specifically geared towards us med students who are going to become doctors. And oftentimes people are very focused on save, save, save so that when you're older, older and retired, you can then spend. But there are yeah. certain moments in life where he said, like, if it costs like twenty thousand dollars for you to take your your family to go to like Disney and create memories with your kids, that twenty thousand mm-hmm. dollars is a lot more valuable, like then to create those memories than it is just in your bank account to spend twenty years from now, because you're not going to be able to create those memories again. Um, is there anything you could kind of share? Uh, in regards to that. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. Uh, It's one of those things where different people need different lessons at different points. And so I think a lot of our society um, doesn't need that lesson, you know, (laughs) but I think there are plenty of people who do. And I'm one of those people who do, you know, and honestly, the last couple of years, once I hit 40, I turned 40 um, two years ago, like a lot of things started shifting for me because I realized that over my last, I don't know, 15 years or so, I have developed good financial habits that have served me well and that are going to take care of us in our quote retirement years. And, and so, so that became my norm. That became my, my habit and my rhythm. And so we have money that we're safe for retirement. We have like that is kind of taken care of. And we have that routine and rhythm in place to, to, to move on that. But to your point and what you're talking about that he was saying, uh, yeah, I have little kids right now, um, you know, from age four to nine. And there are certain things that we can do right now that we will not be able to do in 10 years. And there's other things in 20 years we won't be able to do. And what I don't want to do is whatever at age 70, have a couple million dollars in the bank and be wishing that we had done some of these things at, this point in our lives. And so it's a tricky thing, but I think the first thing is to set the rhythm in place by basically automating as much as you can, automating retirement savings, automating funding the Roth IRA or whatever, um, you know, so that, 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 that is taken care of. And then from there, when you see those moments, uh, where it's like, all right, this is one of those moments. I think we should do X or Y, uh, Mm -hmm you know, to take advantage of that, you know, but, but I think what too many people do is the opposite. It's like, everything is one of those moments. So just like the guy with the Starbucks, it's like, I'm going to get Starbucks every single day, you know? So, you know, and I mean, you're a med student, like, so you have a level of discipline and I'm assuming a lot of your peers are the same way that, that hopefully isn't that big of an issue for you guys. You're clearly not super impulsive beings, um, or you wouldn't have made it to med school, you know, but but anyway, that's the point is that it is a different lesson that different people need to hear. But um, but yeah, that's a really good point that some people definitely need. Okay. One thing that I came across um, was learning about you is uh, kind of the the giving side of, of finances and that you and your wife give your age as a percentage, mm-hmm. right? So 40%. Yeah. One, um, I'm... Like, is that, so 
out of your gross income, um, or I guess after you pay off any administrative um, fees that you have to kind of run your business, just to kind of wrap my head around. And then two, could you kind of go into the reason behind that? Uh, because in my mindset, I'm thinking about how much I would be earning in the future. And I think about like the overhead of that I'm going to have to pay like as a, as a doctor to run a clinic. And if I were to give roughly 40%, there's not going to be much left. So there's definitely some thinking that you've put into this and it yeah. makes sense. And I'd love to hear some of that. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, breaking down the numbers. So, um, so we have our business and this is a separate thing from that. So we, my wife and I both get paychecks from our business. Yeah. So we're essentially employees for our business. Out of that, out of our paychecks, we take 40% of our gross. And that is, or it's 42% right now, um, what we give. Uh, and so that's kind of how we have it broken out. Um, and then in terms of like profit with the business, like most of it, we're just putting back in. But if there is profit, um, and we take a distribution, then we would do that same thing on that as well. <clears throat> now, as far as the reason behind it, this was just one of those things, you know, another one of those God things where I was praying, asking for God um, to help us get our mortgage paid off faster. And in that, like I had this, like one of the clearer things I've ever sensed him lead, lead me to do which was, I felt like he said to me, um, if you really want to see me move on your finances, I want you to begin giving your age as a percentage of your income. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, and so anyway, so from that point, uh, I mean, it, it wasn't like immediate, oh yeah, let's do that. Like I definitely had to wrestle with that for a while. And mm -hmm. Lynn and I talked about it and it's like, this is crazy. This is crazy, crazy, crazy. But it was also one of those things I was like, I didn't make this up. I didn't come up with this, you know? And, um, and anyway, so we started doing that and nine months later, our mortgage was paid off and I'm like, oh, wow. this is just bonkers, like just <laughs> absolutely crazy. Um, and so anyway, so we've been doing it ever since. And uh, just one of those things, proof that Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And it's like, we didn't give all that money just like thinking, oh, you're going to pay off our mortgage. Like I honestly thought it was going to be the opposite. I thought like right. I'm laying down my desire to pay off my mortgage to be able to give all this money away. But um but yeah, but God did it. And uh, anyway, so yeah, we've continued that for the last um, probably 11 years now, I guess. And it, I've found it to be a very helpful framework for us in terms of keeping the proper amount of tension. Because when you have too much money coming in, you just get sloppy. And, um, you know, so maybe, maybe like your friend, again, I don't know him. I'm just using that as an example because yeah. that represents a lot of people where it's like, I just always have enough money here. So I never tell myself no. And any human being who never hears the word no just becomes weird really fast. You know, and this is like whatever childhood actors or whatever, Justin Bieber or whatever. Yeah, I, I guarantee funny. you that he would say, <laughs> I never, no one ever told me no. And it's like, you know, and so it just, you, you become weird and you, you just start drifting from, I think who you want to be. Like, it's, it's like never working out. Like you just become weaker. And the no that you hear actually makes you stronger and more resilient. So I I like this because it forces me to have to say no every once in a while. Like I can't always just go buy everything I want on Amazon every single time without thinking. Like I have to actually think about it sometimes. And I have to tell myself, no, Bob, you can't have this this month. You need to wait for next month, which is really healthy. Um, and a lot of people with higher incomes uh, don't experience that a whole lot, you know. Um, so I've found this framework to be really, really helpful because it creates, it adds that friction for us, but then it also allows us to give, um, which is our number one financial goal. Like how much can we give over the course of our lives? Because again, we're thinking eternally in the Bible in multiple points talks about how giving is one way that we can store up treasures in heaven. And again, if I'm an eternal being, I don't want to focus all of my I don't want to think just about the here and now, like eternity is a long, long time. And if this is a significant thing that we can be doing for eternity, why not? Uh, so anyway, so that's a little bit of how and why we've landed on that. Okay. And for those of us listening or those who are listening that maybe don't have not started giving or they give inconsistently, do you have any recommendations of kind of where to start and then 
how do you know when to increase it? Is there, should you give enough that it makes you uncomfortable? So that causes you to trust God with kind of the rest, right? Um, what are your, your thoughts there? Yeah, a couple different things. Uh, so the first thought is um, making it automatic eliminates the inconsistency. So you make you set up some auto pay thing or whatever to your church or some other organization you want to support where it comes out the first of the month. It's like mm-hmm. it's automatic. You will be consistent. <laughs> you don't have to think about it ever again. And you're now a consistent giver. So so that solves that problem. Uh, the next part uh, in terms of how much like, yeah, like I don't think it matters. Like just start. And so one percent, you won't feel it. You know, there are very, very few people listening, if anyone, who will feel a 1% thing per month. And that's what's so beautiful about it. At the end of the, in our last chapter of our book, we talk about what we call the 1% challenge, which is basically we're encouraging readers to increase your giving and your savings by 1% every year. Because if you do that, again, I challenge anyone to come back to me and say, oh man, Bob, that was so difficult. We increased our savings and giving by 1% and it was, it's been so hard since we ever did that. Like no one's ever going to say that. <laughs> like I just know it. And, and at the same time, each year you're incrementally growing. It's such a small clip that you don't feel it. But yet over the course of a decade, you've now increased your savings and your giving by 10%, which is if you do that and you start that in your twenties, like it's, it's all but impossible not to have a really successful financial life and you don't even feel it. You know, that's, what's so beautiful about it. Yeah. Um, so that's like the first, uh, kind of answer to that. The other thing I would add to it based on what you said about giving more than you're comfortable giving, um, CS Lewis, we actually did a podcast about this. Um, CS Lewis, he said he had one rule for giving and that was it. <laughs> he said, I've concluded in everything. Cause he really wrestled with money a lot. Like you can do a little bit of research on him and, um, yeah, he, he had a lot of like tension with money and like trying to figure out and blah, blah, blah. And anyway, all that to say, this brilliant Christian thinker uh, landed on that. He said, I've determined one thing that when it comes to giving, the best thing we can do is to give to the point that it's uncomfortable. And I don't know, that's just stuck with me. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, now, you have three courses. You have the book as well. Could you kind of go into in the last 10 minutes that we have maybe uh, talking a little bit about what's in the book, what can people expect if they buy it? And then also the course is like, feel, I want you to promote it just so we're aware of these resources sure. that can definitely help me and help uh, the listeners. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the book's called Simple Money Rich Life. Uh, and more or less, it just kind of lays out the the plan that my wife Linda and I followed, the framework that we followed, the uh, it's it's the operating manual. I think that's the best way to describe it of our journey of the last 17 years or something. And so it breaks out the high level formula while kind of going into our story. But most importantly, it goes down to the nuts and bolts of how we manage our money so that we were able to, um, our biggest goal that we reached was we wanted to be able to give away a million dollars by age 40. And at age 39 in eight months, we crossed that mark. Um, and so that was a, like for us, just a personally um, satisfying goal um, that we had, you know, so this was how we did that. Um, and so, you know, and even if that's not your goal, you can obviously benefit from it. If you want to save a million yeah. by 40, like this, you know, would help. But uh, but that was the thing. So we decided to write a book just around this framework, as well as the specific things that we do down to, again, how we're budgeting our money, how we're handling specific things. Um what apps and tools, like I get really into the nuts and bolts with all of it. So, so that's what the book is. Uh, as far as the courses, like we were talking about the budgeting thing for somebody who doesn't want to budget, start with that one category budget idea we talked about earlier. If you want to go deeper, we have what we call our real money method course and where it's basically that on steroids where we just kind of break down the one budgeting system that worked for us. We've had nearly 2000 students at this point. Um, and it just works. Like this is what it comes down to. So if you've tried other budgeting things, they don't work. Like try it because it just works. Um, and then two other courses that we have. The next one is called our True Financial Freedom Course. And I would say this is more of a Christian 
um, focused course on uh, managing money in a way that honors God. Um, and I think there's a lot of overlap between that and our book, Simple Money, Rich Life. And then the last course we have is we have a investing course. It's called 10X Investing. And basically we help new investors get started investing, make their first investment and really do this in a wise way. Um, I think biblically sound long-term way because there's so much, especially like as crypto has come out, like there's just so many people doing so many dumb things when it comes to investing. And I can't tell you how many people like I lost my life savings, whatever, buying this one crypto coin. Um, and, and, and I need to give this preface. Like I, I own crypto, like, uh, 13% of our portfolios in crypto. And there is a way to do that with wisdom. But the point is, is that you don't want to be in a position where all of your money is going into some random crypto coin you heard somebody, you know, tweeting about. <laughs> like, I've just seen yeah. too much of that. So this course will help you lay the foundation of wise long-term investing. Um, and then for those who do want to take a small percentage of their portfolio and get into crypto, it's like, we talk about that as well. Okay. Sounds good. Sound. I think I could definitely use uh, all of those <laughs> courses as right. my my life up until this point has only been learning about the human body <laughs> and medicine kind <laughs> of like surviving. And now I got to do all the catch up in regards to like business and finances to make sure I avoid uh, some of the mistakes. Yeah, well, you'll do fine. You'll catch on quick. <laughs> So within these last couple of minutes, something that I actually like to do at the beginning of the podcast, but I forgot, is some like rapid fire questions. So I have a list of some pretty straightforward questions. Um, I'll just ask you, and then you can kind of give me a, a short answer, and then we can sure. uh, finish off the, the podcast. So where did you grow up? St. Louis, Missouri, and moved to Nashville, Tennessee about eight years ago. Okay, so that's where you live now. Mm -hmm. yep. Nice. That's fun. I, I th I've driven past through Nashville, never really got to enjoy it, but I've been there. I can say that. Yep. <laughs> What's one of your favorite books? Can't be yours. <laughs> uh, what is one of my favorite books? Man, I'm like on the spot here. Um, let's say... Uh, man, I'm like... <laughs> Atomic Havocs, James Clear. I'll say there you the go. Right <laughs> First one that kind of comes up or you see. Yeah. What is, I think I know the answer. What is one of your superpowers? Uh, I I am good at thinking long term, I think. We'll say okay. that. Good. Uh, what do you feel is holding people back from finding success in the financial aspect of their lives? not thinking long term. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we live in a world where everyone is thinking just about this moment. And I, I'm absolutely convinced that to the degree that you can think beyond um, is how you have success in almost any area or field. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. It's true. What's one of your favorite quotes? Um. Mm -hmm. what is a favorite quote uh i don't know i'll just take jesus um give and it shall be given unto you good measure pressed down shaken together shall men give into your bosom that works the name of this podcast <clears throat> is born unstoppable what are three traits of someone who is unstoppable in your eyes. Um, what do you think makes good. somebody unstoppable? Uh, I would say, I don't know, persistence, I would think fall into that category for me. Um, uh, I think humble and willing to learn. Okay. Yeah. Those are all good, good traits that <clears throat> will help in that, that perseverance and overcoming the challenges that, that come up. Um, let's see here. One or two more. What would you tell your 20 year old self? Uh, I would say don't marry that girl. 
Um, <laughs> I didn't marry her, but I was tempted to marry her. Um, so I'm glad I didn't. Got a better one. Uh, yeah, and it, I the, the, here's the thing that I think is really crazy. So I'm 40 now, and it's funny. Like I, I distinctly remember being 20, and I sound old when I say this, but like it feels like it was just yesterday. And I thought when I turned 40 that I would be a different person than I am, than I was then. So as a 20-year-old, I thought 40-year-old Bob would just be like, I couldn't connect the dots. I just saw 40-year-old Bob as a different human being who was not me. But now I see that I'm just that 20-year-old, just a little bit older and I still feel like that 20 year old. I don't, I don't feel any different, you know? So anyway, I, I don't know how to put that into words other than I wish I would have understood that then because now I understand that. And so when I think of 60 year old Bob, uh, I feel like I have a better grip or better understanding of what that's going to be like to be 60. Does that makes okay. sense. <clears throat> I can, I can see that I can relate with it because I still feel like high school for me wasn't too long ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I did the math, it's like over 10 years ago, but yeah. my body just hurts more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm just 27. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So how can people get in touch with you? Sure. Yeah. I mean, our website um, is called seedtime.com, S-E-E-D-T-I-M-E.com. Uh, and so, yeah. So get on our email list. Um, we send out helpful stuff. I don't know, a few times a week. Um, we're on Instagram at Seed Time. Uh, your grab our podcast, Seed Time Money Podcast. Okay. Well, yeah, I definitely recommend people to check out your podcast. Very helpful. And YouTube channel. I was watching some videos about investing and using a calculator to kind of see the, the trajectory of what your finances could look like. And so for anybody that wants to learn, highly recommend check out all his resources. And Bob, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to share your experience, answer some questions. And uh, may God continue to bless you, uh, your business and your ministry. Amen. Thank you, brother. I appreciate having me on. And uh, yeah, I hope this helps some people. Hey, thank you again for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, it would mean the world to me if you left a five star review on whatever platform you're using. Maybe that's Apple or Google Podcasts. It would mean a lot. Also, if you know anyone who has an unstoppable story, is inspirational and is having success in their area of expertise, then please send them my way so that I can share their story with others and encourage more people to live the life that they were designed to live. And I'll see you on the next episode.